First, I want to give a, a kind of shout out to everybody around the world who's watching this. That was a really impressive listing. I worked for 11, 12 years in international development, working for NGO, lived in India, uh, spent a lot of time in Africa, worked with the United Nations system, UN development program. But about 20 years ago, I decided to come back to the United States and hopefully take some of the lessons and the wisdom I'd learned around the world and apply it to our situation in the United States. So I wanna start my remarks with um, a kind of design challenge for those of us in the United States. And I'm talking about the design of our system, our political economic system. Last September, as they do every year, the US Census Bureau issued poverty statistics for the United States, the wealthiest, most successful economy in the history of the world. Last year, we broke the record. Over 48 million of us in this, the richest country, live below the federal poverty line. One in five children in America live in poverty. And if we measure poverty in the way that most other countries do, which is to take the median income of a country and then half of that median, and those living below that half of the median are in poverty, if we applied that standard in our country, we would have about 75 to 80 million of us out of about 330 million living in poverty. For those of us in the middle class and the working class, um, things haven't gotten much better either in this last period. Over the past three decades, uh, the top 1% of income earners uh, 30 years ago earned 10% of all the income in the country. 30 years later, the top 1% owns 20% of the income. And meanwhile, for the 80% who are the sort of broad working and middle class in America, uh, wages have been stagnant and barely increased at all. Wealth inequality, the third point I want to make about the design of our system, wealth inequality uh, is truly staggering. It is a fact that has been uh, fact-checked and documented that just 400 people, not 400 large corporations, not 400 very wealthy families, 400 individuals own more wealth than the bottom 180 Five million of us. I have a good friend who's a political economist and a historian who studied this, and in his view, that's an almost medieval wealth concentration parent. I, that is, if you look at feudal Europe in the 14th or 13th century and look at the concentration of wealth, there is not that significant a difference between us and 21st century America. And so our topic today is alleviating poverty and what I want to look at is the design of our system and an alternative design, because these kinds of figures I'm giving you, they're not aberrations, they're not mistakes. They are, in some ways, logical conclusions of the way we've structured ourselves. Yes, we're very productive, but yes, we're generating ever greater amounts of wealth inequality. So if we want a different outcome, if we would like to not have such growing poverty, my view is we need to look at new ways to organize ourselves and structure ourselves. And that's what I want to talk about. So my topic is building community wealth through cooperative ownership. I'm going to walk around a little bit now. So another way to organize things is what uh, my colleagues and I call the community wealth building paradigm. And it has certain principles to it that's different than the way we do most of our business. And those of you in business school here will recognize that. The community wealth building paradigm tends to promote more broader forms of ownership, cooperatives, employee ownership, and so forth. It anchors capital and business in place so it doesn't get up and leave. I'm living in Cleveland now. In the 1950s, there were more Fortune 500 corporations headquartered in Cleveland than any city in America except New York City, except Manhattan. Today, there are two or three left. The businesses got up and left. Community wealth building anchors businesses in place. It's a paradigm that stops the leakage of money from our communities. In other words, instead of buying things that come from thousands of miles away, this approach to economic development tends to say, let's produce things locally so that we can go to a vendor, give that person money, he or she will go and spend it locally and you'll get a multiplier effect. And there are other aspects here as well, but that's an approach to economic development. This chart shows uh, something important and those of you who are in business school, a question for you is how much are you learning about all of this? 
because these are new kinds of economic institutions that have grown up in the United States over the last 30 or so years that are organized around community wealth building principles and therefore trying to produce different kinds of outcomes. So we have things like community land trusts, which hedge against gentrification, escalating housing prices. We have employee stock ownership plans. Did you know that there are over 11,000 companies in America that are owned wholly or in part by the workers in those companies, not by outside investors? Over 11 million people work in companies where they are owners. And yet, in most business schools these days, we're still not really learning about that. There are community development corporations, four to 5,000 locally based, rooted in community, housing and economic development and job creation types of institutions. Today I'm going to talk in particular about cooperatives. One of the most interesting models in the world right now, and I hope that you've heard of it, and if not, you should really study it, is Mondragon in Spain, the Basque country. In the 1950s, Mondragon, this Basque set of provinces, was deeply poor, deeply poor, worse than anything going on in our inner cities today in the United States. And so a group of people got together and they said, look, no one's coming to save us. We need a new approach to doing things. And they established a first cooperative with five students, put together their first cooperative, and they worked with a Catholic priest, 1955. 2013, there's an integrated network of 120 cooperatives in the Mondragon system. They employ almost 100,000 people, over 85% of whom are owners of the cooperative. Last year, they had revenues of over $20 billion US. And those of you who follow what's going on in Spain now, you might know that Spain has an incredible unemployment rate, 26%. For people the age of most of the people in this room, 18 to 30, the unemployment rate in Spain is over 50%, one out of two. In the Basque region, in Mondragon, the unemployment rate is about 8%. And the reason for that is, they have a commitment to keep their people working, even in tough economic times. Companies are more successful, absorb workers from companies that are less successful. They voluntarily cut their hours, but everybody stays employed. That's part of the community wealth building paradigm. I want to tell you about Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm going to give you a story because we were inspired by the example of Mondragon. So this is happening up the road about two and a half hours. But as I tell you the story about Cleveland, what I'd urge is you don't just think about, well, there's something interesting in Cleveland, but how might this apply to where I live and to my own community? What we're working on is called the Evergreen Cooperative Initiative. We have three goals, create jobs, in inner city neighborhoods where unemployment rate is about 30% uh, and 40% of the folks live below the poverty line, generate wealth for people. By that we mean not only pay a family supporting living wage, but organize these companies as cooperatives. They're owned by the workers so that as they're profitable, the people that put the labor into creating that profit share in the profits every year. And third, to stabilize neighborhoods that have been radically disinvested. Our strategy draws on what we call anchor institutions. And I'm going to show you some maps in a minute. But let me just say, in Cleveland, we're very fortunate. We have a number of large hospitals, uh, Cleveland Clinic University hospitals, universities like Case Western Reserve University, museums, and so forth. These are called anchor institutions because they don't get up and leave. They're rooted in place. Ohio State University has been here a very long time, and it will be here in 100 years, and 200 years, and 300 years. Businesses will come and go from your community, but you can bet on Ohio State University will be here. It's an anchored institution. And these institutions tend to be huge economic engines. Usually, in the case of OSU, always in the top five employers in a community, employing, uh, purchasing in the Cleveland context, $3 billion of goods and services every year, and they're rooted in place. So it makes sense for them to spend their money in a way that improves the community which they cannot exit from. And that's really the evergreen strategy, as I'll show you. So I'm going to show you, those institutions you saw are all grouped very closely together in Cleveland, for those of you who know it. It's called University Circle. And now I'm going to show you the neighborhoods that surround them. So if you look up here, that 
red circle, inside of that is where the big institutions are. I'm going to show you three or four slides quickly. All of the little green and yellow boxes up there, that's vacant property. That's not parkland. That's vacant property where there used to be houses or manufacturing and so forth. But over time, as population has decreased, the manufacturing's offshore, lots of buildings have come down. So you have a lot of disinvestment, and that's what vacant property shows. Whoop. OK. Slides disappeared on me. So what I would show you, had we gone forward in this, is that if you kept building this out, what you would find is that you have 43,000 people living in these neighborhoods. You have tremendous foreclosure, water shut off, housing collapsing, and so forth, yet surrounding those $3 billion of assets. We're going to, this is called doing this on the fly. So, so the Evergreen strategy, we've started three companies in Evergreen to date. And our strategy is really to work with the place-based anchor institutions that are purchasing billions of dollars in goods and services and find opportunities to direct that money locally so that if you're using laundry services, for instance, why not do the laundry right in the neighborhood from your hospital rather than send it 50 or 100 miles away? It just makes sense to do it locally. So what are the purchasing opportunities that can be sourced locally? And then second, once we identify those, we're building up a network of very entrepreneurial local businesses. These are startup businesses capable of winning the contracts from these institutions. And we're employing people locally and organizing them as cooperatives. The third part um, that I think will resonate with a lot of people here is our businesses are green. We believe as a business proposition, not only ethically and morally, but as a business proposition, if our evergreen cooperatives are the greenest in their class compared to competitors, then we are more likely to win the business of hospitals, universities, and the kinds of institutions like OSU that are themselves trying to become greener. So that's really the evergreen model. Local purchasing from big institutions, startup companies that are owned locally and organized cooperatively, and three businesses that are the greenest in their class. And I mean green in a true way. I don't mean it as greenwashing, where every corporation in America these days is promoting itself as greener than every other corporation, and yet the environment still degrades. I mean it by saying, you know, do business with an evergreen business, and we can demonstrate to you how much carbon you will save over a year compared to a competitor, how much water you'll save, and so forth. And so I mentioned three businesses. One is the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry. This is gentleman's Keith Parkham, who is a supervisor in the laundry from the neighborhoods, was unemployed when we opened this facility. Evergreen Cooperative Laundry works in the healthcare bed linen space. We um, are at about 65% capacity now. We'll ultimately do 10 to 12 million pounds of bed linen every year for hospitals, nursing homes, and the like. It's a business that will employ 50 people, ultimately. We're a little over 30 people right now. And it's the greenest such commercial laundry in Northeast Ohio, and maybe in all of Ohio. Our laundry is in a lead gold building. No competitor has that. It typically takes a, a commercial laundry four or five gallons of water to clean one gallon of bed linen. We use 0 0.8 gallons, and so forth. All of it owned by the people who work there and based in the community where people live. Our second business is called Evergreen Energy Solutions. We do large-scale solar installations. We've done 600 kilowatts to date. These are large arrays that go on the roofs of buildings like universities and hospitals. We're about to start a one megawatt solar field right in the heart of Cleveland on five acres. It'll be one of the largest solar arrays in the country. It is, in effect, a community-based energy company, again, owned locally and rooted in the community as a cooperative. We also do weatherization, roofing, and other things. And then my favorite project, if any of you are in Cleveland on February 25th, you're invited. We're having the grand opening of what's called Green City Growers. We've assembled 10 acres of land in the heart of Cleveland with the help of the city. The mayor of Cleveland is a very big supporter, as is our local philanthropy, the Cleveland Foundation, and many others. 
This is what the facility looks like. We've got 10 acres of land on which we built a four acre greenhouse. It's enormous. Four acre greenhouse is about 180,000 square feet. We're going to be producing three million heads of lettuce, hydroponic year round agriculture, three million heads of lettuce every year for the local food market, and 300,000 pounds of herbs like basil. One of the beauties of this project is it puts no one out of work who's farming in Ohio. Because you may not know it, but when you're eating lettuce in Ohio, except for the peak summer months like August, your lettuce is being trucked in 2,000 miles from California and Arizona. So we're substituting 2,000 miles of carbon and transportation. We're employing people locally. Uh, it's in a conf uh, enclosed facility. Here's another picture. This is what it looks like when you're growing 3 million heads of lettuce. Now, you know, in 30 days, the heads of lettuce are really big, but these are the baby heads. Uh, people are planting 10,000 uh, plants every day, day after day after day, to make these 3 million heads of lettuce. And we're going to be uh, developing a whole other network. The goal here is an integrated network, again, a very entrepreneurial, locally based, owned by the community and the workers in them companies, greenest in class, they're designed to substitute imports coming into our community, produce living wage jobs. We offer a no-cost health package, each company for the workers. Workers don't have to buy their health coverage. They get it as a matter of right of being a worker owner. And hopefully, we can contribute to the revitalization of our community's economy. So to summarize our strategy, work with anchor institutions locally, create new community-based cooperative businesses, greenest in their class. We don't want to put out of work people who already have jobs, so we look for where is our economy expanding. You know, in Ohio, we have an aging population. Some would say that's a problem, but on the other hand, that's going to mean more nursing homes, more senior centers, more more uh, retirement homes, and that means more laundry, and that's more business for these kinds, of, uh, these kinds of companies. And we want to move to scale. And for us, scale is not just three or four companies employing uh, you know, 100, 150, 200 people, but again, an integrated network that can employ at least 1,000 people, and hopefully more. Our goals create jobs, as I said, for neighborhood residents, anchor the businesses so they don't get up and leave, one of the ways you can restrain a business from leaving is if you brought an ownership over it by the people who work there. You know, if we all owned a company ourselves and we worked there every day, we kind of walked to work, we lived it, it was our company, it's very unlikely we would vote to send our jobs overseas. It just wouldn't make sense. So it's a way to restrain the capital. We want to promote asset accumulation through this profit sharing for the workers every year. Stop money from leaking out of Northeast Ohio stabilize neighborhoods and develop a replicable model. Um, by the way, there are, by my last count, 16 or 17 cities around the country that are starting to look at their own ability to create some sort of evergreen-like model. And they range from Pittsburgh and Atlanta to Washington, D.C., to even Amarillo, Texas, uh, a very conservative, very red part of America that thinks this kind of strategy just makes sense for their people. I just came back from England, by the way, and in England and Wales, and now I just learned in Ireland, they're starting to look at this model also, and might it be adaptable over there. So that's the evergreen story. Um, sorry you didn't see a few slides, but I think I told the story okay. And um, these are the first three of our companies. Uh, we invite you all to come to Cleveland and see what we're doing. And again, February 25th is the greenhouse opening, 10 a.m., in the heart of Cleveland, you won't be able to miss it. Um, and finally, I guess I'd just say to all of you, particularly those of you in business, this whole field of community wealth building is really growing around the country. And it really does meet a lot of the needs, particularly of our urban areas. But we need talented expertise of the kind you can provide. There simply aren't a lot of people going through business schools now and going through universities who are learning about community corporations, who are learning about social enterprise, employee stock ownership, community land trust, individual development accounts, 
cooperative management. Your skills are needed for this challenge that's facing our country. And so I'd invite you to participate. Um, if you'd like to learn more about this, um, feel free to email me. My email is thoward1, T-H-O-W-A-R-D-1, at U-M-D, for University of Maryland, U-M-D, dot E-D-U. Finally, just a credo I live by and um, want to share with you. Make no small plans. This is not a time to think small. It's a time to think big. Make no small plans and dream big. And if you do that, we've got a bright future in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you.